The picture that you see behind me is taken from a commercial dye on the Cambodia River. And I'll be comparing two systems today, one highly diverse uh, on the Mekong River, um, which this one sample probably has more species diversity in it than any sample I've ever pulled out of the Great Lakes. And that's where my research agenda started, was in a lake system that was well studied and comparing that to a system that is vastly understudied uh, considering the political turmoil that's probably lost many of the records that are there. Um, so my motivation, um, first off, I'm not a molecular ecologist, um, which some of you might be si going, oh, and the other ones are going, uh, with. Um, but I am a data scientist trained in statistics. And so my background was really motivated about studying early detection, predicting where species were moving to, where might they establish in. And so really I asked two fundamental questions. Is the fish here and what fish community is here? And those have been motivating my entire career. Um, I thought the answer early on was math. That changed rapidly when I, uh, took my, when I left my uh, PhD. And that started because I had these three gentlemen that were mentors, supervisors, and colleagues, um, which uh, allowed me to just have an open mind and explore and go any direction or follow my nose. And it really started with the gentleman at the bottom, Lindsay Chatterton, who works for the Nature Conservancy, walked into her office one day and said, uh, if, um, if we take a water sample, do you think we could detect the DNA from an invasive species? And the, per the postdoc, Andy Mahon, sitting behind me was a molecular geneticist saying, we're kind of doing that with ballast water. And I made the bright recommendation of, we really should go look for these fish because they have no idea where they're at. Um, and so that's what led us on the path of using environmental DNA. So what is environmental DNA? I call it fish dandruff, okay? I don't know what DNA is when we get it in the water. Did it come from a cell? Did it come from some mucus, a scale, whatever? All I know is it has the genetic signal, uh, a piece of cellular material. And I know a little bit more than that nowadays because the pore size of the filter that we use, it's usually pieces of tissue, at least cells, that are going into our sample. Um, there's lots of things in the environment that affect the DNA. Every system can be quite different. Um, so at this point, we're still learning. When can you detect things? How long does the DNA persist uh, in the system? But these are a few of the common uh, characteristics. Yes, pH really can affect it. Uh, UV intensity can help degrade the DNA quickly. And then my experience, because I've worked in some terrible spots that are highly polluted, bacterial load obliterates DNA in the system. Sorry, I get a little choked up and dry mouth when I talk about DNA. Um, as was pointed out, there's actually two ways to analyze this. I call them the species-specific pathway, which oh, I did not want to go that far that fast. There we go. Um, the species, it all starts out the same. You have, a, in this case, a, a fish, and it's sloughing DNA into the system for many manner of ways. You collect that water sample. In our case, we filtered it, we extracted it, and then we can go on the pathway of looking for a unique segment of DNA that we can sequence and have high um, confidence that it is exactly that species. The other way is that we're looking for a region of DNA that is variable within it so that we can determine or distinguish the species within many reads of DNA. Okay, and so there's a couple of, path a couple of assay approaches. Oh, I did it again. Um, there is the uh, PCR, qPCR, digital droplet, and I believe we're now using CRISPR-Cas, uh, I should add to that list as a, a definite approach. And, and that gives you just, yes, that species is present, and it can be very useful. The other approach tells you this list of species that are there, um, and that's what we'll probably focus on mostly today because that's where the, the kind of the direction is going. I will point out that they do not have to work independently of each other. You can take the same water sample, and if you get something uniquely detected in a water sample using uh, high-throughput sequencing, 
a good practice is to go back in with something very unique in a different region of DNA and test that sample to make sure that DNA is actually present in the system. And when you're dealing with controversial invasive species, this is a really good practice to have ready to go. Now we'll go to this slide. So I worked on uh, actually two species of big-headed carps that invaded the, or that were, uh, well, how do I put it nicely? We had the Clean Water Act and we thought, oh, we'll get rid of the chemicals to clean our water and we'll bring in fish species that'll help clean it. Unfortunately, brought in big head and silver carp and they actually decreased the water quality. So instead of getting rid of them, uh, the US EPA decided to say, uh, reach out to fish farmers and say, um, would you like to take these? Maybe you could farm them and make some money off of it. And like all good rivers, it flooded shortly thereafter and they spilled out and escaped. And what you see is on the left here, um, the spread dynamics of the big headed carp and on the right is the silver carp. You might know the silver carp from YouTube videos. They're the ones that jump out of the water and knock out kayakers. They have a very unique feature when they have a pressure wave of some sort, they uh, feel it and they will jump straight out of the water. Um, if you throw electricity in the water, it gets really exciting. Um, if you see this on the right, it's too late to stop this invasive species. Fact is, Asian carp don't take a hook and line. Um, they are able to swim up to nets, take a hard right, swim around them, and as far as we can tell, every common uh, technique for catching them was uh, elusive. They just could not catch them. Um, and that's when they were claiming, we need a new technique. And so this is where eDNA came from, was we've got something. Um, to give you a little background about the growth of eDNA as a research area, um, we published the first eDNA paper in 2011. We took our first samples in 2009. Um, I want to acknowledge Faisatola for having done the, the first eDNA paper. Uh, unfortunately, he was studying invasive American bullfrogs in France. Um, so um, great study, another invasive species. But the first two studies really that did this, we were focusing on a management concern because that's where we're at with invasive species. How can we detect these things before they cause problems and damages? We wanted tools that would take us there quicker, sooner, uh, and more effectively. Um, I Thompson, uh, just a year after our first study, came out and I think did the real hard yards, brought the metagenetics approach to us and said, now you can look for whole communities. And then Maya in 2015 uh, published a paper saying, here's a set of markers that we've really tested and shown to be broadly applicable across different sites. Um, and I'd like to point out the red line, that's 2019. Um, it seems a long time ago uh, when we published that first paper to that point, but there's now a journal dedicated to environmental DNA. Um, it's not included in this figure because it hasn't been around long enough for ISI to incorporate it into its web base. So all of these peer-reviewed publications that have occurred right about here, that it actually jumps up quite a bit because a lot of those specialized papers are now ending up in uh, a specialized journal. Where are the papers going? One of the things, hallmarks of a mature science and a mature understanding of the science is that you stop moving away from methodological development and start moving into the realm of conservation biology, management actions. And if you look at where the papers that have been published over the, the last few years, or the, the life history of uh, environmental DNA, it has a wonderful smattering of very different journals. Everything from the highly specialized technological development to the conservation concerns. Um, things like conservation letters, conservation biology. Um, and then you get the ones that are I very interdisciplinary. And if there's a hallmark of the environmental DNA world is this interdisciplinary idea. You have to have fisheries managers working with molecular ecologists, working with data scientists on everyday basis in order to make these programs really work. All right, this is really about data science, less about eDNA. eDNA is the conduit to talk about a little bit of this. When we talk about data science, most people think about the bioinformatics pipeline. 
and that is taking all the sequence data that you get out from high throughput sequencing and then matching it up to known species reference databases so that you can say this is the species that was detected. And that has dominated the conversation of data science in the eDNA world since inception, since Thompson at least. Um, but when we think about it, we think about this strategy of bringing data in, cleaning it up, trying to transform or model or visualize it some way so we can communicate a story behind it. And that's true for any data science type approach. Um, but I want to talk about five additional data science applications that are critical. I've worked in terrible spots. All right, highly polluted systems, so it's nice to go to the ocean and see clear water. I wish I could filter a liter of water back in the day. Um, but yeah, just I've been there, done that. I don't have to work in awful environments anymore. Um, the five data science applications that I want to talk about are lists of expected species present. Surprisingly, this is a, this is a challenge for many of us uh, in fisheries management. Integration of risk assessment, invasive species risk assessment to identify what's potentially going to show up. The evaluation of markers. There's actually many markers that are available for assessing uh, what fish species are present. Which one do you use? It's a question that every manager's got to face when they take on a, putting together a program. Um, assessing the geographic robustness of markers. Where can I get by using one assay and is it transportable to a different watershed or a different region? And where does it start failing? And then calibration through synthesis. And I'll keep these last two short. I'll follow this general format. Um, my goal is to science serving society is to try and solve problems. So I find this a format to really address that head on. The, the problem that we first want to tackle is all about species lists. Surprisingly, when you look at records and databases of where species are present, many of them are very outdated. They're built on historical records, and some of them are simply not relevant anymore. Species move. We saw that in a couple talks already today. We are seeing shifts uh, in species. We're seeing impacts of climate change, pollution, water use patterns. In California, we, now, we no longer have some lakes um, because they've disappeared, we've dewatered them. There's no fish there. It's an easy one. Um, other places, we've had such invasive species problems that the dominant species are all non-natives uh, in the system. So yes, there is ongoing research, and we should feel fortunate when we work in systems that are highly studied because we know what's there. But there are a lot of systems in this world where we simply don't know what's in the, the, the water system. Um, so. The idea behind how we can tackle this is we can use multiple sources of information, and this is really the, the crux of data science these days. How do you pull in multiple databases, get them to work together and unify them so at least you can get a reasonable species list with and set some priorities for uh, building an eDNA program? And that robust database is useful well outside of eDNA, might add. Um, I'll tell you a story about the Great Lakes in a moment, but um, we decided to go head first into a really tough system, and that was the, the Mekong River. So we reached out, well, we started with uh, a program um, that was called GAP eDNA, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, but GAP eDNA relies on this Tedesco et al. 2017 database of fishes in freshwater uh, by watershed. It's actually very good, and it identified straight away 933 fish species in the Mekong River Basin. Then you have another group, the MRC, uh, the Mekong River Commission. They had an ongoing spreadsheet that they were cobbling together of all the fish reports throughout the region. And they had a species list of 1,135 fish. And then there's other sources of information, like this field guide that was specific to the Cambodi Cambodian freshwater bodies, which had 396 fish. Um, and then, of course, there was fish base, which not only do we use for some species records, but we were also able to use it to reconcile names, which is a major problem because as the genetics come through, we start changing the names of what things are related to all the time. And some people change their guide and some people do not change their guide in terms of the fish name. So we crafted a, a workflow 
um, that would read these databases, provide uh, an exist or provided from existing lists. There's a thing in R called scraping, where you can go into technical reports and actually pull in old species lists. Um, very useful when everything's in print form, um, or is from a list that occurred 40 years ago and there is no uh, PDF of it. And then also um, reconcile names using automation. Here's what we found. None of the species lists actually got what we consider everything. All right, these are, the, these are the authorities of what we're supposed to be finding in the Mekong River system, and we found major discrepancies in fish species listed. Why? Because some groups said, oh, you should consider the estuarine fish because the Mekong River actually reverses flow, and for part of the year, you have large numbers of estuarine fish in it. That is biodiversity of the Mekong River system. One group says that's not the biodiversity they're interested in, so they don't have it in their species list. What we're trying to do is find the most robust, comprehensive species list available so that when we put together our eDNA assessment, we can say, here's the maximum list. This is the greatest potential that we have. How well can we detect everything here? Because when we go in, we want to detect all of those species if they're present. Okay. Um, so it can be further refined. Don't think of this as a static one-time-off thing. The next time you find another database or you find it, you can bring that list in and keep developing it. The second problem, we're moving fish everywhere, right? This is, I, I'm speaking to the choir probably on this, right? Um, invasive fish have been moved around the globe. Um, what's good in one area is a problem in another. Um, and the fish species, for instance, in the Great Lakes, is one of the most invaded systems. Of some, many of our prized fish are non-native fish. Uh, and we have a lot of problems with invasive fish. Um, Many systems, we don't know what's going on. We don't have a clue what's being introduced, what's being farmed, what's escaping. Um, so feel fortunate if you live in a country or a space where we have good monitoring efforts, because there's a large part of the world that has no monitoring. It's a free-for-all for what fish species are being moved around. Some would argue the United States is a little bit of a free-for-all, because it's a bring it in and find out if it causes damage and then stop it program. Um, so. Invasive species are very damage, uh, damaging. One of the biggest problems with invasive species is setting up a surveillance program. Because nobody wants to go out and not find fish, mainly fishery managers. Like, I went out all day and I didn't catch any of the invasives that we were supposed to find. And what happens to those programs? We caught nothing for five years. <coughs> those programs aren't funded anymore. So one of the problems that we're trying to reconcile with eDNA is why not have both? You can have a program that does species surveillance of your native species for monitoring impacts damage and changes, but you can also have a coupled invasive species early detection monitoring program. And if you get an invasive species, now you have money from the invasive species program to pay for the, the monitoring program of the native species. So they can go hand in hand and solve dual, a dual problem. Um, and really, it's about initiating an early detection program. Let's give ourselves a chance to actually eradicate or control invasive species. Because far too often, the first instance we have an invasive species is someone coming in going, do you know what this is? And by that time, it's usually too late, and we have an establishment. So let's talk about the Great Lakes. This is the opposite of Cambodia, or, and of the Mekong River. It's very well studied. There's so many universities and so many fishery scientists that have touched the waters of the Great Lakes as a study system. We really do know many of most of the species that are there. Um, and so we looked at two. Again, we used the Tedesco data from the gap analysis, but we also used the probably the, the quintessential paper, which was written by Roth. And even that found differences in species. Some of them are arguments that are ongoing about was it a species or not? But we, they went extinct, so we don't know. And we don't have, they're all in formalin, so we don't have the genetics either to figure it out. But there's ongoing arguments, but we're still finding differences. We wanted to include all of them. Um, and so you can see the Great Lakes Basin. The other argument came in is, do you consider the species in the Great Lakes or the Great Lakes watershed? And people write different things. So uh, again, Roth was in the Great Lakes. 
the gap analysis was in the Great Lakes watershed. And then you always have the influence of the St. Lawrence Seaway. So again, we wanted to take as much as we can, make it as robust as we could when we talked about what was presently there. The great thing about the Great Lakes and all this research is we probably have more fish risk assessments than we know what to do with. This is not all of them. These are the most current ones. So we have inter international uh, species, uh, international lists, you consider the world's worst a starting point. It doesn't have that many fish species actually in it. But then you have two, uh, and then you have a, a global invasive fish species list uh, available. Um, then within the U.S., you have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has done their own U.S.-wide invasive species list. And then, of course, there's, a, um, there's one through the Lacey Act, which is always our, um, what is it? It has to cause a damage, and then we put it on the list problem. Um, so, of course, those are invasive. Um, and then you have very specific ones. For instance, you have Snyder, who looked and said, hey, we have all these species from the Pontio-Caspian region that match very well to our region. And so it's a specific point-to-point -point risk assessment. And then you have Davidson, which was much broader all what invasive species have a habitat match that could come into our, and of course there were some fish in that. And then you have pathway specific one, this ND STAIR uh, data risk assessment was all about organisms and trade. Things that weren't there but we know are being moved around by people and are available and people could dump them into the lake or to the system. So as many of the risk assessments as we could, pulled them together and we added a number of new species. So we found there were 203 uh, species already established in the lake, and then 75 additional, or 75 fish were added uh, to the overall evaluation from the risk assessments. The third problem is evaluating uh, the marker choice, and this is where we're going to get into the weeds. This is where we couple those species lists into the eDNA worm. Species lists are useful no matter what. You can use them in manage any management context. Just a good practice to have ongoing uh, reevaluated species list with risk assessments. But when you start designing an eDNA program, you have to ask, which marker do I use? And there's a lot of them out there to choose. So the solution here is evaluation of those markers, going into genetic databases, saying, here's my fish species list, pull in all of their genetic information, find out at each marker or each region of DNA that you look at does sequence information exist for that species at that location? Um, and then find those that perform well. And by perform well, I mean, do they have DNA? And is that DNA unique to the species to determine it? So if we go in and we cut the mitochondria and flatten it out, because I can't think in a circle very well, um, you have a, a mitochondria flipped out like this. Four major regions that we look at with eDNA metabarcoding is the 12S, 16S, CO1, and Site B regions of eDNA. Um, and there's a lot of legacy and reason for that, most of which is there's a lot of genetic variability for species uh, in, in there, those regions. But these are all the markers that were published as of 2021, I believe. And you can see there's considerable overlap. In 12S, you get markers that are very similar. Some are longer, some are shorter, but you get this overlap. In the 16S area, it's nearly all overlap, and then there's one over here that's oddball. I I, that's part of the marker I helped make, so I'm, I'm proud to say it's unique. Um, it doesn't work very well, but it's unique. Um, then there's a, uh, this uh, CO1 region, and you see again they're all piled up, and I'm sorry this is cut off, but you get the same, same one. And the question is, which marker would you use? So if you're a fisheries manager setting up an eDNA program, you now have your fish species list, you know what invasives are likely coming in. Now you have to tell the, once you go out and collect the water samples, you have to tell them which marker do you want run? Which one do you choose? And so in the Great Lakes, oh, I I, this is not work that I did. I'm speaking outside of my book, but I just want to highlight uh, some amazing work. This is work by Virginia Marquez. Uh, that came out in 2001. This is an app that's online. It was written in R. Um, and it allows you to go into watersheds, click on that watershed, and download the data for any marker you specify. It works in ocean regions. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for the oceans, people. I'm a freshwater person. So you go figure out ocean regions to me. But you can, you can look in these different region areas, and then you can also look in watersheds. 
and you can literally pull down all the, whether there's a sequence available for it, you pull down that database, you can pass it back in and get the genetic data to actually go in and look at and say, is this a unique sequence that I can, actually, that I can spe get species specification? Fantastic interface for the, the common manager to give. Here's the problem, it's not updating. We got species lists, but they're all from uh, the eDNA or ENA December 2021. There's a lot of work uploading sequences going into databases. So we need to somehow integrate this so we're getting, mo as more genetic information comes in, we update that database um, and we'll do better. Okay. So when we look at the Great Lakes specifically, if we ignored invasive species, just that we're only interested in native species or established species, certainly not native. Um, we only look, we have 203 as our baseline. That's the, the maximum number. The best marker that we can choose is this 12S marker. And then we have 16S, more 12S. Clearly there's a pattern here about where, and of course there is. Those markers are all overlapping each other. We shouldn't be surprised that if one does well, the other one should do well. But you can at least go in here and say, I'm getting about 150 of the 203 uh, species are detectable and unique. So we can choose that marker. But that's not all the species we're interested in detecting. So if you go in and say, well, let's take only the regional risk assessments. We now move up to around 232 species. Wait, yeah, 232 species that we're interested in detecting. Uh, it's a combination of established species and potential invaders. We see a pretty clear shift to using the 16S marker, although not a huge loss. We have this still nice flat plateau across the top. And then if we say throw everything at it, these are all the invasives, we want to be ultra secure, we want to start building it out. Um, we can see that we get around 278, uh, or there's 278 is our max window, and we can get just over about 220, I believe, somewhere in there, um, species that are detectable. What does it also give us? It gives us what we can't see. Right? It tells us, here's where the marker works, here's where the marker doesn't work. First thing I can tell my manager, what's on the not detectable list? Is there anything in there that you absolutely have to detect and know about? That's an important piece of information to tell them whether they want to go forward with an eDNA program. If it's because there's an absent amount of DNA, that becomes then a target species we can go out and collect as tissues from and fill in that knowledge gap. So this is a very empowering piece of work to help managers build a better and more refined eDNA program and stepping through it. Um, so as the databases grow, um, as we fill in more information, eDNA is getting better and better in terms of detectability, and we are filling in many of these knowledge gaps. All right, but that's not the only question that we can ask and answer in this situation. Um, that's if we use one marker. What happens if we run one marker, say, here's the best we can do, and then we say, of the remaining species, what marker would I choose to get the most of those? And of the remaining species after that, what marker would I choose to get the most of those? Generally speaking, when you get, there's always a limited amount of DNA you get in a single sample, right? You can't run ass assays forever. It's like every time you start using up more of your, your mixture. We've been in the past able to do up to five, but that's really stretching it. And if we get something controversial, we have nothing left in order to check it. Ideally, we'd be somewhere in the one to two. It also gets really expensive when you start doing multiple uh, marker sequence runs. But what we can see with the Great Lakes is you come in, you start with a 16S, you could then do a site B, another site B, then you do a 12S, and then there's barely any, there's a little thin band up here it says you can get up to that dashed threshold. So that's the maximum that we could do using all the DNA we had with as many markers as we had. But again, until we get better filled in databases and we can get a better idea of which marker to use, or maybe if we can start doing whole genomes of all the fish species, we can find that sweet spot of a marker that does an excellent job of really getting species specific across all the DNA that's in that, that system. All right, the last uh, of the five, or no, the fourth of the five. Um, 
I feel like I'm being so practical today because the most common thing that happens when we're, people are interested in setting up an eDNA monitoring program, especially resource managers, is, well, I don't want to pay for all the upfront cost. Okay, um, there's a real risk in doing that. You can just blindly choose a marker and go for it. It might have worked. But if you can kind of find the other regions that have similar fish species, maybe you can pull your resources and all get behind developing an a priori eDNA program that's set up which marker to use, how many samples. And so in trying to figure out how we might answer this question, it all comes down again to species lists. What species are present and what invasive species are likely to invade that area? And so what you can do is basically assess beta diversity. Um, and so this is an example from California. California has a very diverse uh, river system. Um, it has, uh, you can think of the state as long and oblong. Um, you have high, or you have rivers to the north that flow into high cascade, much wetter environment. Uh, uh, and then you have river or systems that run to the ocean. And then you have uh, streams that run to the east side of the Sierras, which are actually terminal lake systems. Very unique fish species in all of those different regions. And so what happens when you do uh, beta diversity is you find the whitewater region standing out totally unique in and of itself. This is an east side of the Sierra. This is very lots of endemic California species found nowhere else in California. That would probably need its own environmental DNA program. Rogue and Warner uh, watersheds, those are in the very north. Then you have this smear of very similar, uh, of very similar watersheds. Most of these are along the, set, the coastline. They all run to the ocean and they're all within California, running from the Sierras down into the ocean. And then over here you have the Death Valley, Owens, Colorado, Truckee, Humboldt. These are all terminal lake systems on the east side of the Sierra. So the defining land feature in California, other than north to south, is the Sierra mountain range, which runs along it. The idea being, maybe you can get by developing an entire eDNA assay that's very robust and useful for a large swath of all of these systems. So they can pool all their money in those regions to try and make an eDNA program and do all the front end work to develop which marker, how many samples, where, when uh, to sample. But um, so we're, this was all done with exist established species. Um, we'll be doing uh, a little bit more work to incorporate invasive species here shortly. The fifth one is calibration. And I saw a wonderful poster outside here that was showing comparisons of eDNA to tra traditional methods. And that's what we've been wanting to do for a very long time to kind of show proof of concept, how robust is eDNA metabarcoding compared to other methods. The real importance here is showing, okay, can, we com can eDNA compete? There might be a necessity to it, but how well does it actually do? Um, and so we really wanted to set same assay to very specific same day sampling. That is not the data that we have. We have assays from every different region of DNA, some single markers, some two markers, three markers. And then as far as traditional methods, you name it, we got it, all right? It's historical records, it's electrofishing, it's um, trawl nets, um, all types of different fishing gears, some of them with extensive effort. Um, and we said, well, let's see what we get. Let's take and say, you do the best you can do and we'll throw this one eDNA asset at it. And I have to tell you up front, I really thought eDNA would underperform or not perform as well as the conventional gears. That's not what we found. So this is called Bland-Altman analysis. It comes out of the medical literature, and it's about calibrating. Think about two temperature probes, and you want to find out if they work, but you don't know what the actual temperature is. You just know that they're very similar. That's what you're doing here. You're putting eDNA in the water and saying, here's the fish species richness. You're putting all the conventional gears in, and here's the fish species richness, and you're comparing it. And if there's no difference between the methods, this confidence interval, these two dashed lines, capture zero. This is two standard deviation with a confidence interval, two standard deviation with a confidence interval. So in freshwater systems, there's no difference across all the studies up until this time, 104 different sets of observations between eDNA 
and conventional gears. Mind you, it's all over the board, all right? So maybe not surprising. Yes, there are two data points down here that are clearly outliers. And there is reason to believe that above 100, 125 species, we probably are having real uh, genetic library issues. We don't have populated genetic libraries to populate what's going on. So one of the punchlines of this talk is we need studies in species-rich environments that are pop with populated databases. Marine systems, the confidence intervals are enormous. You can drive a Mack truck through these things, all right? Um, there was only 17 studies when the study was done, but the asterisk up here, it says that an update is coming soon. This work was led by one of my grad students, and she's found something like 50 more studies in the last two years, so there is an update coming. The other one that we looked at is primers, since we talked about it. If you use one primer, there's no significant difference between eDNA metabarcoding and traditional gears. However, when you use multiple primer pairs, the 95% confidence rule does not capture zero. eDNA actually outperforms conventional gear. So that's meaning, given what we know, it's filling in that knowledge gap about what species are detectable, and they're actually detecting more species. Okay, so last, a few comments, and then I'll be done. I'm a data scientist. I need to say something about R and R Studio. Um, thank you, Fishbase, for having an, a package. I got some suggestions. Thank goodness you have one. Um, it makes life a lot easier. Um, this is kind of like me, uh, this is a little preachy, um, I have to say. I worked in Cambodia. We finally have Cambodians working on Cambodian data and they're making Cambodian decisions. And that's happening because they have a package or they have a software that they can use and take control of. No longer am I the person going there, getting their data, coming back and saying, here's what it, ha here's what it means. They're taking ownership of their own resource. And we can do that because they can do the analysis and we don't we're no longer the gatekeepers. So there's something about data science that's really important here and it's gonna happen with fisheries, whether you're dealing with eDNA or not. We're gonna be able to train the next generation and all of the countries take care of all of their own data. Um, and it's really been this software license ba barrier. So I'm very indebted to R&R Studio and they deserve that shout out. I wanted to comment because we're in uh, a museum, and museums are about collections, and everybody said, oh, when you have eDNA, you're gonna get rid of all the taxonomists. Not true. There has never been a more important time for taxonomists than now, because the genetic sequences have to be matched to an understanding of the fish's morphology, and there's so much more that we need to understand that going on. Uh, there is lots of space for eDNA and taxonomists to live and work together, and frankly, come and work with me, because <laughs> if we need more of you and we need more info. Um, the one thing I would advocate is more infrastructure to our museums, because we're moving from collections and space to house physical specimens to housing space of high resolution digital images so we can do morphometrics, but also the genetic signatures of whole genomes of fish species taken multiple times across or multiple ti across time and across space. And that takes a lot of space, storage space. But uh, genetic data is digital data. Um, and the last one is, this is just getting started. I, I feel really lucky to be at the beginning of DNA because that's about all I can handle in my head. Um, there's this whole omics revolution going on. There's gonna be a time where we can take a water sample and say, these are the fish species that are present here. These are the ones that were here really recently. And this is the stress that the system is experiencing because this is the number of heat shock proteins that are upregulated, or here's this molecule that's present in the system. And it's a really exciting place to be, but that means that we need to start taking voucher specimens where we have the fish species, the genetic whole genome of the species, we have an eDNA sample to tell you what else was with that species, and we have the environmental covariates that go with it. So, it's a pretty exciting time to be thinking about vouchers and about uh, the omic revolution. Um, and then lastly, it's just a shout out to think about making sure your data is findable, accessible, access findability, accessibility, interpretability, and reuse um, with all the data pipelines that are going on. 
we need to have more and more access. I'm still finding new fish databases to incorporate in, but they're hidden in somebody's filing cabinet in, P in like a written form, um, and they're not out there. Um, I have a lot of collaborators. The ones in yellow are my graduate students. Um, I think it's important to talk about this next generation of fisheries managers and fisheries scientists and the tool sets they have. Um, I'm not gonna thank COVID, but COVID played a part in every one of these shifting from a field-based program to a data science program. I don't think any of them thought they were gonna have our, our skills when COVID hit, but this is what we all pivoted to. Um, and they've all uh, really exceeded. Andy Mahon has been my genetics resource for 15 years. Um, and then John Darling, Adam Sepulveda, and Aaron Gray have been the consummate colleagues that have kept me in check when I go, I don't know, I made this figure. And they went, no. <laughs> so with that, thank you. Um, and if you have any questions. Thank you so much. That was an awesome talk indeed. I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. Uh, Thomas Johansson from the Baltic Salmon Fund. Thank you, Christopher. It was really interesting. Uh, do you think in the future that we can have the possibility to see how many in percent of every species? I, I think just about the, the big trawlers we have out in the Baltic, uh, the fishing for sprat, but they catch, of course, they have bycatches of, of herring uh, and salmon and other fish species to see how mm, in percent uh, how big uh, difference in the different species is it possible do you think that <laughs> i'm on the fence yet on just from the raw eDNA okay. and the reason for that is i've seen the environment drive dna concentrations around too much mm. yet even with constant level um so there's the environmental part of it. There's a massive behavioral part of it that we don't understand. You get fish spawning happening, suddenly you have a pulse of high quality environmental DNA going out in the system. So there's behavioral parts that we don't understand. And then there's an inherent amplification that happens in the, the process of doing the assay. So those are the negatives. There's a lot of researchers showing correlation at this point, relative abundance. Maybe it's possible that we can get to relative abundance. I think that there are some smarter people than I that are working on population biology <laughs> <laughs> that are going to make headway with effective population sizes, with relative abundance measures, with models that incorporate our environmental understanding of how DNA is degrading or behavior. I'm not there yet. That doesn't mean we're not going to get there but I think it's gonna take a group of really bright, interdisciplinary trained scientists to get us to that point. Thank you. Right, one more question. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation here, it was new. I'm uh, Ole Aberg from uh, uh, Recirculating Aquaculture in Sweden, and um, we are working in, in like closed containments. And uh, when you talk about this uh, early detecting of uh, invasive species, I immediately think of fish pathogens. Uh, and uh, uh, I would be very happy if I could detect early <coughs> invasion of things uh, that can affect my, my uh, trouts. Um, and also if I could follow the dynamics of this, because I think there is always there some shit, but if, yes. it, if it doesn't grow, it's no problem, but if it grows, it is. I would encourage you to go look in depth at the COVID literature. One of the things we learned is that you can monitor sewage treatment outflow and get an idea when the next spike in COVID is going to happen. Beautiful papers on it. Same idea, looking at pathogens. There's some lovely work that's been done. Um, Catherine Smith is her name. She's at Brown University. She looked at organisms in pathway, pet pathways and different types of uh, 
fish diseases that are coming along with ornamental fish and trade. So there's things out there, and I think it's an amazing world to look at, um, but certainly worth exploring. There are people working. I believe there's some work actually on the Canadian salmon farms already occurring too, so it might be worth reaching out to your colleagues there. Thank you. I think we have to cut. Yeah, we have to cut, and I think Christopher will be available during lunch and during breaks. Uh, thank you for a great first session of today. Mickey, do you want to say a few words before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm going to give the presence that I forgot for all the speakers so far, but you're going to get one, Christopher. <laughs> it's too late for the other ones.